study of Matthew, but uh, looking forward to getting back into it. And as I mentioned last time, we were in Matthew. I'm, I'm most likely going to just skip chapter 24 and 25 because I actually taught that not long before I began the study of Matthew. And so if you weren't here for that or you'd like to go back and review it, it's on the YouTube channel and you can check those messages out. So once we finish 23, and it, we're going to finish 22 tonight, and there may be one or two messages in 23, then we're going to be jumping to 26, and uh, it won't take us too long to get through 26, 27, and 28. And when we finish with Matthew, we'll start another book, okay, whatever. Uh, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't really decided on that yet what that'll be, but if you have a request, let me know. I've had one request recently for a book to be taught. And, uh, uh, and I may be doing that on Sunday, but uh, we'll see. Anyway, Matthew 22, I remind you that in the context, Christ gives three parables while he's teaching in the temple. And remember, this is the, the week of his death now. We're headed toward the cross here in the context. And he's in the temple teaching. He cleansed the temple, and then he teaches and he gives three parables beginning in chapter 21, verse 28, and running through chapter 22, verse 14. And the three parables illustrate Israel's rebellion against the Father, against the Son, and against the Holy Spirit. You see in the parable of the two sons, and we're not going to go back and look at it. I'm just giving you a little outline here. In chapter 21, verse 28 to 32, that uh, would speak of their rebellion against the Father. And then in the parable of the householder, in chapter 21, verse 33 to 46, it's in that parable they say concerning the householder's uh, beloved son. They say, this is the heir. Uh, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. You see the rebellion and rejection against the son and rejection of the son in that parable. And then in the parable of the marriage feast in chapter 22, verse 1 to 14, the servants go out uh, concerning those that are bidden to the wedding, announcing that they could come. And uh, it, it's the Spirit of God, uh, of course, that speaks through God's servants to give the message. And it's in that parable you see that though Christ in His earthly ministry was rejected, it's made clear that there's going to be an opportunity after that. Remember now, Israel rejected the Father throughout the Old Testament. They rejected the Son of God in His earthly ministry, but it's after His resurrection they have an opportunity to repent and they reject the witness of the Holy Ghost in early Acts. That's when they fall in Acts chapter 7 when they stone Stephen, a man filled with the Holy Ghost. They would not repent as a nation. But you see in this parable back in uh, 22 verse Four, In verse 3 it said they would not come. And then it says in verse 4, Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. All things are ready. The call went out, but it was rejected. But then another call. All things are ready. In early Acts, everything was ready for them to receive their king and his kingdom. But as a nation, they would not repent. And then it's announced how... Uh, the city would be destroyed and so forth uh, in that parable. So I thought that was interesting as we're headed toward the cross and he's in the temple teaching, he gives three parables that illustrate Israel's rebellion against God and there's something in each three that has to do with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now in the remainder of Matthew 22, Christ deals with insincere questions that were asked um, in an effort to entangle him in his talk. They thought they could set him up and get him off track and trip him up and make accusation against him, find fault with him. So you have a question and answer session here in, in Matthew 22, but it's nothing like the ones we have on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, okay? I think our questions are sincere, uh, but these were people, they didn't want the truth. They were trying to attack the Lord. They were trying to find fault with him. And... Um, it's three main groups among the Jews that were in leadership, and they have been opposing his ministry. Very different groups. The Herodians, uh, that has to do with those worldly people who are yoked up with the world. 
And then the uh, Sadducees, they were the rationalists that denied the supernatural. Then you had the Pharisees, those ritualists who put so much emphasis on washing your hands a certain amount of times before you eat instead of, instead of having a heart right with God. But these very different groups, um, they, yet they come together on the common ground that they're against the Lord. I mean, they had been posing one another, but now they're kind of working together in their opposition against the Lord. You know, they had already failed to trip him up. You see it all through his earthly ministry. This is not the first time they tried to entangle him in his talk. And they have failed. But now they're coming one last time, giving it their best shot. But you know what? At the beginning of the earthly ministry of Christ, Satan came tempting him three times. And how wise is he? Of course, he's no match for God. But how wise is Satan? He's very wise. But he couldn't trip him up. He couldn't mess him up. He couldn't get him to do wrong. But now he's using his, his followers. And of course, these religious people, they, they don't think they follow the devil. But Jesus said, remember to the unbelieving Pharisees, you're of your father, the devil. And he's using these men uh, here at the end of his ministry uh, three times. They come tempting him, trying to come against him. Of course, they'll fail just like their father, the devil. Now, the chapter concludes with Christ putting his enemies to silence with just one question of his own. They come to him three times, and he responds perfectly. And, uh, but he asked them just one question, and it shut them up for good. They didn't ask him any more questions after that. So, verse 15 to 22, this has to do with the Herodians. Verse 23 to 33, the Sadducees. Verse 34 to 40, the Pharisees. And then verse 41 to 46, Christ questions uh, them. So let's pick it up in verse 15, read down to verse 22. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying... And this is an, uh, an illustration of state and religion working together. That's always a, a bad union. <laughs> okay? And here they are working together and saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man. Now, what do they mean by that? Well, it's explained in the next statement here. For thou regardest not the person of men. Uh, he, in other words, he was not a respecter of persons. And uh, tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? And that was a big issue of the day. But uh, if you go back and search the law of God in the Old Testament, I don't see anything in there that says they could not do that. Of course, if they would have been right with God, they wouldn't have had to do that. If they'd have been right with God as a people, they wouldn't be under Rome's dominion. But God knew they would be in captivity. God knew they would be under bondage to Gentiles. He knew about the times, obviously, of the Gentiles that would come. And so there was nothing in the law whereby God said you couldn't do that. In fact, if you remember back in chapter 17, Christ already paid tribute. He already gave the tax money to Rome. Remember that? With the, fish, the, the, the coin that was in the fish's mouth, how he performed that miracle to pay the tribute? So he had, already, he had already done it. So he, and obviously he's sinless, so he's not breaking any law uh, in the Old Testament. But anyway, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Um, and they thought they had him here, boy. They thought it, either way he answers, we can get something on him. Because if he says no, they're going to say, oh, he's a conspirator against Rome. He's trying to overthrow the Roman government, and, uh, and they're going to make that accusation against him. If he says yes, then they say, oh, well, he must not be the Messiah. If he was the king, what is he doing saying pay tribute to Caesar? So they think they got him set up here. But Jesus perceived their wickedness. Now, they come to him and say, thou art true. <laughs> And teach us the way of God. And what are they doing? They're buttering him up. 
they're flattering him. They don't mean what they're saying, and that's wicked. And by the way, you ought to do a Bible study and find out what God thinks of flattery. That's of the devil. These people are of the devil. But you know what? Jesus didn't fall for it. Most people do, though. Most people are so simple-minded, all you got to do is give them some attention and kiss up to them. And they'll fall right with you. That's how most people are, sadly. But the Lord's not. He saw right through the charade. He says a bunch of wickedness. Of course Jesus is true. Of course He taught the truth. But He knew they didn't believe that. So He said, Why tempt ye me? In other words, why are you trying to test me? Ye hypocrites. Called Him out on it, didn't He? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto Him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Such a simple answer, but it's very profound. And they knew it. It says, when they had heard these words, they marveled. I mean, they really thought they had him this time. But he had them. <laughs> And they marveled and left him and went their way. Now, I think it's interesting how it's put that way. They went their way because they weren't coming to his way. Even though they knew he was right, they wouldn't submit to, to him and his authority. They would not repent. So these Herodians, they were a political group among the Jews. Basically, the reason why they're called Herodians is because they supported Herod. They recognized Herod uh, having authority over them. Uh, the Herodian dynasty appointed by Rome. And these were very wicked men, the Herods. And yet these Jews actually... And you know the Pharisees hated their guts. If you know anything about the Pharisees, they hated the Herodians. But here they are working together. It's interesting how that dynamic comes to play sometimes. You see people who don't like each other, but when they both don't like someone else even more, they'll sometimes come together against that person. But uh, they were basically cowardly compromisers. They desired political peace at any, at any price. They just wanted everything to be comfortable. Don't rock the boat. We'll submit to Herod because, you know, we can be prosperous as long as we uh, follow him and don't cause any problems. And again, they, they're, what they're doing here is they're, they, they start off trying to flatter Jesus and they're trying to set them up, though, to make an accusation against him. Now, hold a marker there and look in Luke chapter 20. And by the way, parallel passage with this tonight would be Mark 12 and Luke 20. In Luke 20, about this same thing here, it says in verse 20, And they watched him. And sent forth spies, which should feign themselves just men. Feign means they're pretending. They're trying to pretend like they really care what he has to say. That's why they, they say, oh, you, you, you teach the truth. They're feigning themselves. It's a facade. That they might take hold of his words that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. So they're trying to set him up so they can make an accusation to deliver him up so he would be punished. And uh, boy, that's wicked. Have you ever had that experience? I've dealt with people, literally, I'm not kidding you, that came to me just like this, that feigned themselves a certain way to try to get me to say whatever they thought that I was going to say so they could use it against me. And that is about as, I mean, that's, that's what you call being a snake. <laughs> you know, like the devil. <laughs> hey, folks, you got to watch out for man, okay? Um, you know, it's just, that's the way that flesh is. And again, I'm not going to run all the references, but check what the Bible says about flattery and about those who use it. It'll be, I mean, can't trust people like that. Okay, someone says when somebody's always patting you on the backs because they're wiping off a place to stab you. <laughs> There's a difference between a sincere, encouraging word 
and buttering someone up because you got you got a motive behind it. You're trying to get something, you know. And uh, you got to watch out for that stuff, boy. I tell you, it's very real. Now look in chapter 23 of Luke. Luke 23. So when they come against him to crucify him, notice they began, verse 2, Luke 23, 2. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation. In other words, he's trying to get the nation off track and, and, and to do the wrong thing and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the king. Now, he is the king. But where did he ever forbid to give to Caesar? He just said, Render unto Caesar the things that are seen. And he did it himself. Remember, again, chapter 17, when the issue came up with Peter about paying tribute, and he told him to go get the coin out of the fish's mouth, pull up the fish first when you get, take the coin out of his mouth. So this is a false accusation here. But see, that's what's behind all of this. They're trying to, uh, they, they tried to set him up. He didn't take the bait, but they made the accusation anyway. And by the way, accusations are easily made. And just because an accusation is made doesn't make it so. Some people, man, they, they, you tell them anything. Well, did you know this? Oh, yeah, really? And they just believe it. Jesus Christ was falsely accused. The Bible says not to receive an accusation without two or three witnesses. But people are so quick to believe the dirt, aren't they? It's very unjust. So, back in Matthew 22, Christ gave the perfect answer. He gave the perfect, obviously. He's the Lord. You know, he, he hadn't set up his kingdom yet. And you got to recognize that there is human government in this world. He's the one that instituted it. So he said, look, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, to God the things that are God's. That's the perfect answer. And all they can do in response was just marvel at his wisdom, yet they would not repent. They marveled at it, and then they went their way. Again, until Christ sets up his kingdom on earth, people are to recognize the place of human government. It has a role. So don't worry about it. Everybody's phone goes off at some point or another in the service, right? Mine has many times. Um, Paul, in this age, taught us in Romans 13 about the role of human government, didn't he? And I'm not going to turn over there and read it. I'm sure you're familiar with it. But Romans 13, if you want to know what the Apostle Paul said to us in this age about human government, study that passage. It has a function, and its function, when you boil it on down, is to protect the good and punish the evil. But when human government begins to punish the good and protect the evil, then you ought to obey God rather than man. We are not, there's no unconditional, God does not expect unconditional obedience to all authority, except His. Always obey God because He's always right. But when God sets up authority, we are to be obedient to those authorities, except when they disobey God. Which, by the way, if, you're, if you have a disrespectful, disobedient attitude towards God-given authority, and they're within their boundaries, operating the way God intended, you're flat wrong, period. I mean, this issue of children in our culture disrespecting their parents the way they do, that's a pretty serious thing. It's, you know, one of the Ten Commandments. To honor thy father and mother. And in the Old Testament, under the law, to, ha to, to, to have a, a disrespectful, disobedient attitude towards your parents would mean death for you. <laughs> That's how serious it was. It, and, and yet Paul said in the last days, it said... He said that uh, some of the characteristics, he said among many characteristics of people in the last days would be they'd be disobedient to parents. And uh, yet having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So don't minimize the importance of learning how to respect and follow authority as God sets it up. And God's word is clear on these matters. 
so the Lord had not set up his kingdom, so therefore they were still, to the extent of the taxation, I mean, they were to, look, it was Israel's own fault they were under the Romans. But that, since they were, they had to pay the tribute. Um, and the Bible speaks of uh, the purpose of tribute and, and honor and all of that in regard to government. And again, this is not a study on all of that. However, while there is a function of human government, we must always keep in mind there is to be a separation of church and state. And I think that um, what the Lord says here in verse 21 is a, a good text to support that. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things which are God's. And someone asked me the other day, are y'all 501c3? So we don't have to be. The Constitution makes us tax it, uh, non-taxable as a church. Of course, things are changing and, and uh, you know, government always wants, they get out of line with the taxation and they, and they want to get more money. But we all individually as citizens pay taxes, so we shouldn't have to pay tax collectively as a church. But the point is, our founding fathers knew something of scripture and of human, the role of human government, and they believed that the state should not have authority over the church. There is to be a separation there. Now, of course, we got people today who talk about separation of church and state, and they take it so far out of bounds and actually think that means that the church is not supposed to influence the state. That's No, that's not at all the point. The point is the state is not supposed to have any control over the church. And there's a whole study on that. You know, the state can, can have your money. <laughs> they have a, the government has a role to fill, and it costs money to operate as a government, so therefore pay those taxes, but they should never have your life. That belongs to God. He took the penny. Whose image is on it? Well, it's Caesar's. Okay, give it to Caesar. Well, when you look in the mirror, whose image is there? <laughs> Man was made in the image of God. Now, I know Adam was made in the image of God, and then he fell and marred the image. Now we're born in the image of Adam. I get the point. But still and yet, we're created by God, and uh, we need to not trust in human government. We need to trust in God, render unto God the things that are God's. God deserves our worship. He deserves our uh, unconditional obedience. Uh, all of that. So, let's look in verse 23. And read down to verse 33. Here come the Sadducees. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. And asked him, saying, Master, Moses said if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now you find that in Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 and 6. It's true. It's what the law says. Now there were with us seven brethren. And the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, and by that he means no children, as interpreted in verse 24, which, by the way, in Isaiah 22, verse 24, there's a verse that talks about the offspring and the issue. The Bible defines itself. If you were wondering what issue means, you look at the context, children, verse 24, cross-reference, it means offspring. At any rate, left his wife unto his brother, likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Well, this is real likely, isn't it? Therefore, in the resurrection, see, they're hypocrites. They don't even believe there's a resurrection. Okay? In the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now some people think when you die and go to heaven you become an angel. And they'll take a verse like this. He didn't say they become angels. He said they're as angels. And here he's talking about the resurrection on the earth anyway. But the point is, you don't become an angel. Okay, uh, That's just a, you know, a common error people have because they don't know the scriptures, right? No, he said, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Another error people have is, and it's in the Schofield Notes, says that angels are sexless. Well, he said, the angels of God in heaven don't marry. 
He didn't say what... Every time angel appeared in the Bible, they're referred to as men. But the angels in heaven don't marry. He didn't say they were sexless. They just don't marry in heaven. Anyway, verse 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God? I like how he confirms the inspiration of Scripture. This was spoken unto you by God. It's in the Word of God. Here it is. Saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living now, if you go back and look at that in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, where he's quoting, it says, I am, and it says, am is in italics in Exodus 3, 6. Here it's not. That's very interesting. Because there, there are those people who try to say the italicized words don't belong in the Bible, in the King James Bible. There's so many verses where I can prove to you they absolutely do. Here's a great example right here where Jesus validates the Word of God. He's quoting from the Old Testament. The word am was in italics. It's not in italics here. It belongs there. Another example is where he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The word word is in italics in Deuteronomy. And it wasn't in italics when he quoted it. It belongs there. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. So they're striking out, man. I mean, strike one, here's strike two. They thought they had him, and they had to walk away marveling. Then here come the Sadducees, next batter. They come up, boy, we got him, we will get him. And he answers them, and the crowd said, whoa, <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. They're astonished at his doctrine. By the way, Jesus taught a lot of doctrine. Okay? He didn't just tell stories. You know, by the way, parables were not just stories, just because he was a storyteller. And, you know, I've heard preachers try to justify their constant storytelling instead of preaching by saying, Jesus told parables, but his parables contained doctrine. <laughs> and they weren't just stories. He told, by the way, he told the parables to conceal the truth from the unbelievers. And then he would later reveal it when he expounded on it to, to his disciples. But anyway, uh, this thing of the Sadducees here. Now they denied the spiritual and the supernatural. In the book of Acts chapter 23, you don't have to turn there, but in verse 8, it says they denied angel. They denied spirit. They denied uh, the resurrection. And so they're like the rationalists, the modernists, the liberals. And they don't really believe the word of God. They did talk about Moses. But they didn't hardly recognize the rest of the Old Testament. But here they come in this vain attempt to make... They're trying to make Christ look foolish for teaching the resurrection. And so they come up with this scenario, this far-fetched, ridiculous scenario. Look how far they have to go to try to make a point. These seven men all had the same... You know, the first one married her and then he died. The second one married her and then he died. The third one... Give me a break. You know, watch out for these people when they come to you with a question. They come up with these what-if scenarios. And it's like, usually if it's a ridiculous, unlikely thing, I'm like, don't waste my time. Okay, because you you're not looking for truth. And they weren't looking for truth here. Their question doesn't even matter. Because the resurrected kingdom saints are not going to be married. <laughs> Alright, so uh, they're going to be a kingdom of priests. In Luke chapter 20... It says about this, he adds some more in the Luke passage, Luke chapter 20, verse 34. Um, Luke 20, verse 34. Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy of to obtain that world, talking about the kingdom age, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. By the way, talking about in prophecy, there's different resurrections. Our resurrection of the body of Christ was a mystery, first revealed to Paul. But there's resurrection and prophecy. Jesus taught in John 5, they that have done good will be resurrected to life. They that have done evil to damnation. And so he's saying these which have been accounted worthy to obtain that world. So this is talking about the resurrection of prophecy to go into the kingdom age. Um, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore. 
So they have immortality. They, they are equal unto the angels uh, in that they don't die. They're not going to die and they're not going to be married. And the children of God being the children of the resurrection. Um, so back here again in Matthew 22. That doesn't mean that there won't be people married in the kingdom age. It's, it's talking about these who are resurrected to be a kingdom of priests. There are going to be Gentile nations, for an example, that get to go into the kingdom. There are going to be people born in the kingdom age. He's talking about those who are resurrected. And I, I, I personally think there's a difference between... Uh, they're going to have immor uh, immortality, but the body of Christ, we're going to have a glorified body that's fitted... To reign with Christ where? In the heavens. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, our body is eternal in the heavens. So there's a distinction there. So it's interesting in Christ's answer here, He affirms everything they deny. You know, they, they, they deny the inspiration of Scripture. They're not real Bible believers and He validates the Word of God. They deny resurrection. He plainly says there's resurrection. They deny angels. He, st he talks about the angels. See, the root of their error was the same as it is with so many today, and that is, number one, they don't know the Scriptures. Isn't that the real problem with people today? I'm talking about even people in church. Don't know the Scriptures. Well, they know some things. They've heard about it. Most people, their understanding of the Bible comes secondhand. It comes from what people have told them about the Bible. Very few are the people that know the Scriptures. And you know what I'm saying? In other words, they know the book because they're in the book, and the book is in them, and it's real to them. Not many people like that. And so they don't know the Scriptures. Look, the Scriptures are so plain about the resurrection. You go all the way back to Job. And he's talking about bodily resurrection. But they don't want to recognize a lot of the Old Testament, so they claim to follow Moses. So he said, well, what about Exodus 3? What God said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. You know what? The promises that were made, they did not see them fulfilled. Hebrews 11, verse number 13 there must be a resurrection because what God promised Abraham, he never fully enjoyed. But he will, because there's a resurrection. Hebrews 11, verse number 13. These all died in faith. He's talking about the patriarchs here. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So they died not having received everything God promised them. What does that mean? He always fulfills His promises, so they must be resurrected. Or God is a liar. And God is no liar. And, and look, if in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, why would you think it's incredible that there's a resurrection? That's nothing to, to the power of God. He said, you don't know the Scripture, which talks so much about resurrection, bodily resurrection, and you don't know the power of God, which, by the way, there is a connection between knowing the Scripture and the power of God, because the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharpening a two-edged sword. And so their problem was unbelief. They weren't real Bible believers, and they didn't believe in God's power to do the things that He says He can do. Uh, Jesus had just said in uh, Matthew uh, 19, He said, With God all things are possible. You know what God can do? Anything He wants to. Thankfully, that means He can't do some things. Because He does not want to lie. He cannot lie, the Bible says. He cannot sin. He cannot fail. Because he, it's not His nature. But everything he wants to do, he certainly can do. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. And um, so it's just interesting how he answers this question, you know. And there's still a lot of people around today. They're so rationalistic. Now, they got some people today, 
that they'll claim on one hand to believe in creation and they'll claim to believe in the virgin birth and they claim to believe in Christ being raised from the dead and ascending to heaven. Then when you ask him, is there a perfect Bible on the earth today? No, that's not possible because of all the years that have transpired. Uh, it's impossible to, for there to be a perfect translation after all these years. Th that's, that's rationalism. That's not faith. God said He would preserve His words. You think God can create the world, but He can't write a book? And keep it perfect? The reason why I believe the Bible is because I believe God. And God told me He'd give me His word, and He did. And I know where it is in English. It's in the King James Bible. So, praise the Lord for His truth. Um, now let's go to the last question here, verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, if they had any smarts, they would just quit. But they're stupid. And so it says they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him, watch out. <laughs> now that's not, that's not uh, John Morgan that you see on TV all the time. Of, of Morgan and Morgan. But uh, this is a lawyer as in a doctor of the law, uh, the law of God. They, they, they were uh, like scribes. I mean, they were, uh, they taught the law. They knew the law. They just didn't believe it and follow it. But anyway, one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. By the way, let me just stop and say, this is an overlooked part here. Mind. You know, that, the average church today omits that. They look down on Bible study. They think that's dry. They think, look, there's a part of loving God that you have to study His Word. You have to think about some things. God gave you a mind for a reason. It's not just all heart. Now look, don't be all mind. The whole person needs to serve God, spirit, soul, and body. But anyway, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I remember reading one time where Bullinger was talking about how people will go into the Bible and just lift a line out and try to make it say something. He said, well, you can go in the Bible and lift a line out and say, hang all the law and the prophets. Well, that was pretty good humor for an Englishman back in uh, 1890. Anyway. <laughs> all right. So great stuff in here. Time is running out, so let me say a few things. So these Pharisees, we know the Pharisees. We've, we've come across them a lot already in our study of Matthew, but there, there are these self-righteous religious people. They pretended to love the law of God, but every time Jesus taught the truth, they got offended by it. The Bible says, great peace have they which love thy law, nothing shall offend them. But they were always getting offended at what Jesus taught because they were hypocrites. They didn't love the law. They loved themselves and they loved their tradition. They loved their traditions more than the law of God. But they say in the law of Moses, you know, there's 613 commandments. And uh, it's pretty detailed and, and complex. And they thought they had it all figured out. Well, oh, this lawyer, I know. I can tell you all these commandments. I can talk to you about all these things. They boasted in their knowledge of the law, but it was not in their heart. So he gets to the root of the matter and said, Look, you can boil it on down. All the commandments in the law, the two greatest is first of all to love God, and then second of all to love your neighbor. And if you would do that, everything else would fall into place. But these guys were get so caught up in the minute details of the law, and they didn't even love God. Okay, look in chapter 23, and we're going to get to this next, next time, but boy, he denounces these Pharisees, but notice what he says about them. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, and he even said that with an exclamation point. For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, 
And I, I don't know if I've ever read that in the law. Have you ever read that where he told them to tithe even on those things? I mean, but they, they added, they, want, they were more strict than God was. They were trying to be so righteous. And he said, have omitted the weightier matters of the law. In other words, you get caught up in all these minute details and things you've even added that aren't even there, and yet you omit what matters most, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, not to leave the other undone. Okay, so go ahead and tithe, but don't leave undone showing mercy. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and the platter of the platter, but within they are full of extortion excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men. But within, you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Man, he pegs them there, doesn't he? So, the point is, they come to him, oh, you know, I know the law. What do you think is the great... And he gets right to the heart of the matter. He's, he exposes them. You don't love God and you don't love your neighbor. You're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. That's what he shows them. So, really, he said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, um, if you take the Ten Commandments, you can divide them into two sections. The first half of the Ten Commandments have to do with loving God. And the second half has to do with loving your neighbor. For an example, if you love God, you're not going to have any other gods before Him. And if you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal from Him. Right? So he's saying if you would just love God and love your neighbor, all these other things would take care of themselves. And by the way, he's not teaching something new here. Loving God with all your heart, that's Deuteronomy 6.5. And loving your neighbor as yourself is Leviticus 19.18. It was in the law. But you know what this means? It means a lot, but let me make this point. Nobody could earn salvation by the law. You, there wasn't anybody in the Old Testament that loved God and their neighbor like they were supposed to. It's not even in the human nature to do that. So, I believe under the law dispensation, they showed their faith by following the law, but the human flesh could not keep the law. If you offend in one point, you offend in all. Nobody will ever be in eternity saying, I am here because I kept the law of God. Okay? So, we've got to be very careful. Even though there's a difference between law and grace, we must never give people the idea that in any age the flesh of man can be righteous in itself. Okay? Now, uh, by the way, this lawyer must have been a little bit more sincere than the others, although at the beginning he's tempting him. In Mark 12, we have some more information how he responds to the Lord when the Lord says this. In Mark 12, verse 32, the scribe said unto him, Well, Master... Thou hast said the truth. He, I mean, he actually acknowledged, okay, hey, you got me there. <laughs> For there is one God, and there is none other but He. And to love Him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and love His neighbor as Himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that, He answered discreetly. He said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask Him any question. So the guy was acknowledging what he was saying was true, so he was on the right track, but he still needed to believe that he was the Messiah and trust in him. Now, let me say this, and we'll move on to the last point here, and that is, and we can preach a whole sermon on this, but you better believe Paul taught the same thing about loving God and loving others. He said in Romans 13, it fulfills the law. If you would, if, if, in other words, if you would love others. And by the way, Paul taught all of the Ten Commandments except the Sabbath day. We're not under the Sabbath. But the moral commandments apply today. And Paul taught that. He taught all of them. Didn't he? I mean, I just one passage. There's other passages. I, let me just say, there's a little pet peeve of mine. I, and I understand where they're coming from. But I've heard people actually kind of almost mock the Ten Commandments because we're under grace. 
I, that, that's not too smart, man. It's still the Word of God, and it's still righteous. Paul didn't mock it. He taught it. Now, we're not under the law, but he applied the Ten Commandments. In Romans 13, he said in verse number uh, 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. He's quoting the Ten Commandments. If there be any other commandments, briefly comprehended this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, because the Spirit of God is in us, by His grace, we walk by faith in that. We can live by this. So there is application. We're not under the ceremonial laws. We're not under a lot of the things that were in the Old Testament. But the moral principles... Never change. God, God's morality does not change. Okay? Um, anyway. A major problem in many churches today is putting the second commandment before the first. And th See, if the devil can't get you to deny both of them, it's then to get them out of whack. And when you put people before God, you're out of whack. You know what most churches are doing today? They're putting people before God. They'll compromise the Word of God to please people. They'll neglect the true worship of God in spirit and truth and serving God in order to entertain and appease man. Paul said, if I please men, I'm not the servant of Christ. He said, I don't please man, I please God. Now, he said, I please man for his edification. But when it comes to compromise, he wouldn't do it. So don't put the second one before the first. It's... It's, there's an actual order. You love God first, then your neighbor. And you can't really love your neighbor till you love God anyway. You've got to keep God first. All right, let's finish up tonight. Verse 41. And uh, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, All right, go and turn the tables on you, jokers. I'm sick and tired of your questions. I got one for you. And in the uh, Living Bible, he came to them and said, Hey, pinheads. No, he didn't say that. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Now, that's the issue. They say they're coming up with all this stuff that is secondary. He said, Here's the main thing. What, do you, what think ye of Christ? You know there's a Messiah that's prophesied. What do you think about him? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord, and he's quoting from Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, the Father said to the Son, there's a Godhead, there's a Trinity. By the way, those who deny the Trinity, how does this work? <laughs> okay. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And that's at the second coming. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? That's a simple question, but it's pretty deep. And no man was able to answer him a word. Because they didn't want to. Because they couldn't answer it without admitting they're wrong. Neither durst, and that's just a good old King James word for saying, no one dared any man, neither dared any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. <laughs> they tried and they tried and they tried and they failed and they failed and they failed. Now, Christ set up the Pharisees with a question they couldn't answer without condemning themselves for rejecting Him. They stumbled over His humanity. They said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Oh, yeah, the Messiah is a carpenter's son. Yeah, okay. That, that was their attitude. They didn't, because of His humanity, they denied His deity, yet it was prophesied the Messiah would be both God and man. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, right? So, how is it that David can say, The Lord said unto my Lord, and the Messiah is the son of David. Okay, and that's clear in many passages. I'm not going to, you know, we're going to close here. But you can go back and see he will be, humanly speaking, the seed of David, right? And yet, David said, he's my Lord. 
So how can that work? Well, Revelation 22, verse 16 gives the answer. Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bride and morning star. How can he be the root and offspring? I'm before David and I came from David. How does that work? Because he's God manifest in the flesh. And see, they were thinking his humanity proved he wasn't deity, but he said, you have to admit the prophecies teach that Christ is man, but he's God. Now, deep down they knew he was right. But they hated him so much they could not bring themselves to admit it. You know, hatred makes you unreasonable. And they, you couldn't reason with these people. Now listen, there are going to be people who will not receive the truth no matter how clear you make it. Could Jesus make this any more clear? And they walked away. They couldn't argue with it. They couldn't defeat him. But they were not going to submit and repent and believe his truth. And so we just have to realize that's how some people are going to be, sadly. Now, Christ, again, by the way, as we close here, confirmed the inspiration of Scripture. As we see him do in this passage on more than one occasion, he said here in verse 43, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Well, over in Mark 12, 36, of the same thing, it says he, David spake by the Holy Ghost. You know what? All through the earthly ministry of Christ, you know what he does? He confirms the authority of Holy Scripture. He believed that the Scriptures they had in their hands was the Word of God. That it was given by the Holy Ghost. That it was God's Word. There's not one time where the Lord Jesus picked up a scroll in the synagogue or temple or whatever and said, now this is an unfortunate rendering. This is a scribal error. He was a Bible believer. So what kind of Christian are you if you're not? You know, who is it in the Bible that questions the Word of God? It's the devil. But Jesus always confirms it because He is the Word of God. I realize there are corrupt Bibles out there you've got to be aware of, but there is still a pure Bible available. And uh, I just love how Jesus... You know what He did, by the way, as He began His ministry? He went to the synagogue and it said He opened the Scripture. And you know what He did before He sent it back to heaven? He opened the Scripture. And that's what a real ministry does. It opens the Scripture. Isn't it sad today that in the average church the Bible is a closed book? Uh, I told the guy today, go ahead on the sign. We're getting a simple sign to start with. We might make a better one later. But the sign we got right in the middle of it is an open Bible. Because <laughs> that's what we want to be, a church of the open Bible. All right. Let's uh, close in prayer. Father, thank you tonight.